All right, so today we're very excited to be here with Mary Jo Dudley, the director of the Cornell Farm Workers Program. She's been working in cooperation with farm workers to address the issues that we'll hear about in a second. She's recently been honored by the White House as a Cesar Chavez Champion of Change for her work with farm workers. So today we're going to talk with her a little bit about uh, these really pressing moral issues concerning farm workers and how food's produced. So maybe let's just lead off talking about, you know, what are these big issues that farm workers um, face? It seems mm -hmm. like there's a special problem for farm workers as laborers in the United States. And there's a long-term problem for farm workers as laborers. And just to give you a little bit of a historical background, um, this, the Cornell Farm Worker Program is interesting in that it is one of the only university centered programs for farm workers that we know of. Um, and it's important to talk a little bit about how that came about. That happened almost 50 years ago, and it really came about because of student activism. Students in the College of Ag and Life Sciences, in order to get their degree, needed to work on a farm for at least a semester or a year. Yeah. And some of the students who were working um, on in the apple orchards in Wayne County actually worked side by migrant workers. Yeah and lived in housing with them. And it became a turning point for their lives. And so they came to the Faculty Senate and said, we need to have a specific program that addresses the needs of farm workers. And over time, these migrant farm workers have changed over time. Um, initially, uh, those people who had been landless slaves who joined on the East Coast migrant stream, um, recent immigrants over time. And so farm work has kind of become a catch point for those people who come into this country who don't have the language skills uh, to take other kinds of employments but <clears throat> are able to work um, in agriculture. Right, and through the ages there's been various protections afforded <clears throat> workers in other industries that haven't been extended to farm workers, so that's part of the practice that's problematic, right? That's right. Farm workers are excluded from the La National Labor Relations Act. So they don't have protections such as the option for collective bargaining, overtime pay, a day of rest. All of those things are not legislated for farm workers. And so that legislation sometimes takes place at the state level. And it hasn't passed in New York State to date. Right. And part of the big issue that we'll see a bit about in a second is the idea that a lot of our current farm workers don't have other citizenship rights due to the fact that they're in the country illegally and in a way that makes them a kind of captive labor force. Uh, some people have used the word slavery as appropriate to these cases, but they're anyway kind of captive and don't have the same kind of legal protections. So one of the roles of our programs is that we have a very explicit mission, which is to address the needs of farm workers and their families. So we interview farm workers um, to try to determine what are the highest needs across the board. And those needs, um, far and above, the highest need is some information about immigration issues, how to navigate within the communities in which people live. And um, a secondary issue is to learn English. And so we have structured our activities to respond to these needs in a very direct way um, by providing support. We do on-farm workshops, kind of know your rights workshops. Uh, this Friday we're doing a big uh, session where we have um, pro bono attorneys who will provide immigration support for those people who may be eligible for the recent Obama uh, announced uh, program for undocumented parents of U.S. born children. Um, so these are some of the things that we do to support um, farm workers as in response to the needs as they as they express them. Right, yeah, so it's this really pressing issue but I think especially through your um, program we're influenced by the idea that there's something that we can do. It's not this horrible problem that's an essential feature of agriculture and essential practice of uh, our current food system. It's something that we can change and still get the food system going without. And so these are, there are some very basic things. Some is that direct support for farm workers and just helping them to navigate in the communities in which they live. Here we have a group of students, um, volunteers, who go out and tutor English once a week. Um, at the state level, there's a proposal for the Farm Worker Fair Labor Practices Act, which would give these legislative protections to farm workers in New York State. That, as I said, that hasn't been passed yet, but that's an area where people can learn more about 
how to change some of the structural constraints. Um, and I think really what we try to do is look at what are the, the major issues are social isolation, the geographic isolation of living in rural areas of upstate New York, yeah. linguistic isolation, not speaking English. And so we try to approach those by providing support to people in their homes, um, as well as organizing different social and educational events that bring farm workers together. Yeah, and so one of the big issues getting people involved in this is the kind of essential invisibility of the practice. And, you know, one of our hopes for this class is we'll get that visibility out there. And I think also both Andrew and I have had the personal experience of it not being something that was initially on our map but we realized that it was a big problem, and then we realized it's a big problem right here in Ithaca. Right. And so we were able to get some footage of a local farm that really impressed upon us how immediate this problem is. It's right here, it's right now. It's not distant in the past, it's not distant in our location. You know, it is really right here. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the context mm -hmm. of the farm that we visited. I think it's, it's very common when there are discussions, academic discussions about sustainability, food justice, that, that farm workers are not part of the discussion. Yeah. And so um, in talking, for planning the course, I suggested that we go to a farm and have a conversation with one of the workers to try to get some deeper insights. Um, and I'd like to just give you a little bit of context before you see what he had to say. This is, as you'll see, a very large, productive, financial vi financially viable dairy farm. But at the same time, you see housing, um, which is very dilapidated. Um, you see the sort of the exhaustion of workers who are working 65 to 70 hours a week. But moreover, what happens when people cannot leave the farm? This the impact of social isolation. Um, this farm in particular was one that had an armed robbery about a year ago. <clears throat> what happens when you live in fear that people may come into your home with weapons? Right. Um, and his coworkers were injured and subsequently left the country. But I think that these themes are ongoing themes. Just to follow up after the filming, um, the particular worker that was interviewed uh, participated in a social event. We do, we organize farm worker socials. And on the way to the event, their vehicle was stopped by state troopers and immigration was called. And so he, since the filming, he is now facing deportation. So to try to understand in, in asking him what are his fears, there are some fears that he, he had already experienced, having somebody break in your house in the middle of the night and injure your coworkers and steal things. But there were other fears that might have been in the back of his mind that, that became a reality because he decided to leave the farm for a, a social event. Yeah, and I think one issue that comes to the forefront of many people's minds when they see this is, you know, what are the, what's the mindset of the farm owners who are employing these people? So we saw, for example, if you look at some of the old, the famous film Harvest of Shame, mm -hmm. you find this, uh, what we think of as now totally outdated or racist ideology that enables a practice. They say, oh, these people are simple. They can be happy despite having these horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I'd think that people at least, you know, a lot of farm owners wouldn't say those kinds of things now. I feel like it's kind of interesting for us to think about what their kind of rationales are. Do, are they under such economic pressure from broader social and kind of economic factors that they have to employ labor like this? Or is it partly also their social relationship with these disenfranchised people? It, it's a really important question. Um, and I think one of the things that we have seen here in the dairy sector in New York State is the labor force changed significantly around 2000. And part of that was that there were not local workers who were willing to do this work. Part of it has to do with changes in, in the industry where it became a 24-7 production area, so people would have to work night shifts. But the basic issue is that it is dirty work it is physically demanding work, and it's socially denigrated. And that coincided with a period where these undocumented workers 
came to the upstate area looking for employment, and so the match was made. Um, there are all, pro all sorts of problems with the match, but if you, uh, if you talk to farm owners, they will tell you they, this was a convenient match, yeah. um, that people showed up looking for work and that they're hard workers and that they enjoy working on, on these farms and that they are successful in their work. Mm -hmm. So that's these, it's kind of the coming together of these trends at the same time. Right, and one perspective that we got is a broader kind of international perspective whereby it seems like one of the factors we have to control for is the unstable political conditions in the countries a lot of our immigrant workers are coming from. Um, where it's kind of like, to some degree, in order to create a just system, we also have to somehow adjust and control for those as well. Well, not to oversimplify, because there are many factors that influence this, but in our research, we ask people about what motivated you to leave home. Yeah. And from their perspective, there was a change when NAFTA was passed where they could no longer produce corn mm -hmm. as a subsistence crop. And so their economic opportunities closed out. And the largest economic opportunity for many folks was to leave home yeah. and to come to the U.S., and to work on farms with the idea always that they would return home. And, and I think that's a piece that is also not present in the public discussion yeah. is that they don't come here to stay here. Yeah. They come here to make money, to send back to their family members to support them, and to build a different opportunity for the future, an alternative for the future, an economically viable alternative for them. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming and helping us contextualize a lot of this. And now I think our students will be eager to see the real representation of the facts on the ground.